thanks for having me here. So uh, today I'm going to talk about subspace clustering. This is joint work with my advisor, Emmanuel Candace. So uh, what is uh, subspace clustering? So th let me begin with a simpler example. Imagine, uh, I think a lot of people would agree with me that uh, uh, one of the most fundamental tools used in data mining is that when you have a bunch of points living near lower dimensional subspace, you want to find the best fit to those points, right? So this is what is known as PCA. Uh, a natural but useful generalization of this problem is when you don't have just uh, points living near a single subspace, but near a union of multiple subspaces. So in this case, uh, the goal would be to first cluster the data based on the subspaces they belong to, and then fit the correct subspace. And this multiplicity assumption arises very naturally because it represents multiple categories in your data. So uh, let me motivate this problem quickly. So there's a lot of applications of this sort of problem coming from computer vision. Uh, I'm not going to have time to go into the detail of these, but I, I just refer to, you the, to the speaker tomorrow, basically Professor Ma. Uh, uh, you will uh, see the relevance of low dimensional structures in computer vision. And uh, if you just add multiple categories, you get to this problem. Uh, another motivation from a different perspective is uh, basically for disease detection. Here the goal is basically to classify different diseases and also to understand the relevant factors contributing to each disease. For example, if you consider metabolic screening, so here uh, the kind of data you have access to is basically blood tests. So for each patient or newborn, you have a different blood test and you measure the concentration of different metabolites. Now, it, it, it turns out that you know, a specific disorder causes a correlation between a specific set of these factors. So what this means is that uh, the set of points or patients belonging to a single subspace, uh, belonging to a single disorder, live on a lower dimensional subspace. So again, uh, subspace clustering becomes relevant. Okay, so let me just very quickly formulate uh, the problem again from mathematically. So basically what we have is cap and unit norm points uh, living uh, on unknown linear subspaces. Uh, the unit norm assumption is not restrictive because I can always normalize my data points. And uh, I'm going to use color coding to denote these subspaces and I'm assuming that their dimension to be by, denoted by D. In general, I'm also going to assume there are a bunch of outliers. So uh, the goal of the problem is basically to find all these outliers and without you know, making any assumptions about the number of subspaces, their dimension, and so on, to find all the subspaces. So uh, let me uh, go over the method I'm going to try to analyze here. Uh, I'll, I'll talk briefly about the history of this method in a second, uh, but the, the basic idea is going to be that uh, we try to write each data point in a self-expressive dictionary. That is, we, we try to write each data point as a linear combination of all other points, uh, all other data points, and uh, so the way we do this is basically uh, we regress each column against all other columns and we impose an M, uh, L1 penalty. So the hope is that if we do this, the non-zero coefficients here will correspond to the same subspace as my original point. So this is, uh, this is what we're looking after. Uh, if we get lucky and this actually holds for all data points, then if I arrange my optimal solutions as columns of a matrix, what I would get is a permutation of a block diagonal matrix, something that looks like this then I could just uh, you know, find the connected components, build an affinity graph based on this, and just find the connected components and do mm, perfect clustering. So this is going to be our goal in this talk, to try to see under what conditions this actually holds. In practice, this might not hold exactly. Then I could use spectral uh, clustering to basically clean up the data a little bit. But this is going to be, you know, we're trying to understand under what conditions does this nice property hold. So this is the algorithm in its full generality. So be before I move on, let me just uh, make some historic mentions. So subspace clustering has uh, been done by various authors. Uh, and uh, 
more specifically in the context of sparse representation, not subspace clustering. Uh, L1 regression was proposed by Yima and collaborators. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, him tomorrow. And uh, this was in the context of face recognition, but it wasn't exactly for subspace clustering because they assumed label data points. Uh, in the context, you know, exactly the problem of subspace clustering and the algorithm I just described, it was proposed by El Hamifar and Vidal. And uh, they, they, are, they are actually the, the people that named this algorithm. And uh, I'm going to refer to SSC for this algorithm from here on. So, but, uh, uh, so even though there are some limited theoretical guarantees about this algorithm, which basically say that this algorithm works as long as the subspaces are independent or close to independent, uh, there's still a huge gap between theory and what we observe in practice. So my goal here is going to be to try to uh, bridge this gap. In fact, the kind of theory that exists so far in literature could be uh, viewed analogous to the kind of results that existed in L1 regression before the seminal works in 2004. So our, as I said, our contribution is to bridge this gap. Uh, more specifically, for the first time, we're going to see that you can do perfect subspace clustering even, the, even when the subspaces intersect. So this is something that was not previously explained in the literature. Uh, we, we are also going to see that the dimension of the subspaces can grow almost linearly with the ambient dimension. Uh, previous result uh, can do at most square root of n. So we get a factor square root of n improvement here. And uh, we are also going to show that the whole process is robust to uniformly many outliers. So uh, in order to analyze our results, uh, uh, we look at uh, basically three different models. The first one is deterministic, uh, which both uh, are deterministic. Then we have a semi-random model, where the distribution of the points are random, but the orientation is fixed. And finally, we have the fully random model. So uh, there's not going to be time for me to uh, describe the deterministic model. Uh, but uh, I just want to say there is a good geometric understanding of this, and there's a theory behind it. Moving on to the semi-random model. So a natural uh, measure, so if you want to understand any subspace clustering algorithm and how well it performs, an, a natural notion of a closeness between subspaces is given by this affinity. Because you know, any uh, subspace clustering algorithm will have difficulty if subspaces are really close. So the, the measure we use is actually given by this. It's the square root of some cosine squared of the principal angles. So if the two subspaces are actually on top of each other, uh, then uh, the, these principal angles vanishes. So this quantity becomes huge, which is square root of d. If the subspaces are orthogonal to each other, all these principal angles become 90 degrees. And uh, this, uh, this quantity becomes 0. So this actually does match our notion of closeness of the two subspaces. Uh, in fact, there is a good uh, statistical understanding of this. The square of this quantity is basically the, the pili bartel test statistics. So uh, our result in this setting, so it, this is a semi-random model, meaning the points were distributed random, but the subspaces were fixed. Basically says that this normalized quantity, remember I just said that this quantity can at most be the square root of the dimension of the subspace. Our result says that as long as this normalized affinity like uh, is less than a constant, basically, up to log factors, then this holds. The nice property we were looking for holds. So remember, this can be at most one, and we're saying as long as it's less than a constant, it holds. So uh, this is a bit surprising, because it shows that this property holds under very general, general circumstances. And also, this actually allows for intersection of subspaces. So uh, let me just show you an example of this actually happening on, uh, at, on, in a semi-random model. So in order to uh, actually be able to characterize the performance of the algorithm, I'm going to use this area criteria, which is basically you look at the L1 norm of support to the total L1 norm. Uh, so, and you take the average over all columns. If uh, the nice property or subspace detection property actually holds, this quantity will be zero. Uh, uh, otherwise, it will be a non-zero quantity. Another nice measure here would be like clustering error, which is basically the fraction of misclassified points. 
Uh, and another quantity we'll be interested in is how well can we estimate the number of soft spaces. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm ba I basically picked two subspaces, three subspaces in, uh, of dimension d in n to 2 times d. Uh, so this example has specifically been chosen to be a bit more challenging because each data point I can represent as the sum of two other data points coming from two other subspaces. I'm going to play around with these angles uh, to understand under what conditions the theorem I just explained holds. So this is basically the, the feature detection error, the first error I explained. The blue correspond to, to where the subspace detection property holds. You can see that uh, even when this normalized affinity is quite high, so here I'm drawing 0.75 to 0.1, and the rho is basically the number of points divided by the dimension of the subspace. So this is basically saying that if the number of points are large enough and the affinity is small enough, then subspace detection property holds. But this quantity is not uh, very small. It's, as you can see, this is 0 0.75. So basically what I'm saying is that the constant in the previous theorem is not so bad in practice. If you actually move to the clustering error, which is after spectral cleaning, then uh, you get even better results. Uh, this basically shows that even for uh, normalized affinity up to 0.9, you, you get satisfactory results. So there is an uh, uh, there is a equivalent result in the fully random model, which basically says that uh, the dimension of the subspaces can actually grow linearly with the ambient dimension. So this is uh, our result in that case. Uh, again, this was not something that was previously understood. Uh, so uh, let me actually skip uh, uh, comparison with previous results uh, and just move to the outlier case. So uh, also, uh, as I said, our result is robust to many outliers. Uh, here the idea is uh, uh, very simple. You, you basically use the same optimization problem and just use the uh, optimal value as, uh, to just detect the outliers. So for inliers, this quantity is going to be small because they live on a lower dimensional subspace. For outliers, this quantity is going to be large. And uh, therefore, you could exploit this gap. And uh, this is sort of the picture of this. Uh, the ratio here represents the gap. For outliers, this ratio is very high. And in fact, you can do this provably. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to show a cleaner result. So basically, what you do is you put a threshold roughly of size square root of n and just threshold the, the, this values, and the quantities larger than square root of n will give you the outliers. So it, the simplest case is uh, imagine that we are in a semi-random model, and we have n0 outliers. And remember, the dimension of the thought spaces is d. The ambient dimension is n. Uh, our result basically says that uh, the number of outliers can grow exponentially in the square root of the ambient dimension. and uh, in fact, uh, this is not true about previous results. Uh, previous results uh, for non-convex optimization problems can at most handle something linear in the ambient dimension. And uh, uh, because uh, in the interest of time, I'm, not, I'm just going to skip this and just, uh, th these are our, our references. Uh, this talk was basically a fraction of uh, this paper, which is due to appear in Annals of Statistics. Then uh, there is going to be a noisy case coming up. And for uh, further reference, uh, I uh, refer to you to the work of uh, my collaborators and also Professor Yima's website. Uh, and this is just the same uh, slide we saw before, just to conclude. And with that, I'm open for questions. OK. OK. Uh, so. Uh, Uh, so again, uh, our contribution was to bridge this gap between theory and practice, was to show that uh, you can have intersecting subspaces. This was not previously done, and in fact, not even close. Uh, so then again, uh, you can get the dimension of subspaces to grow linearly with the ambient dimension, uh, almost, under generic circumstances. And uh, you could handle. Uh, like a, an overwhelming number of outliers. I didn't get to show you the simulations for this, but the number of outliers can in fact be much larger than the number of data points. So 
all of this was made possible because of taking a geometric viewpoint to this problem. And in fact, using this geometric viewpoint, you can characterize not only uh, characterize all of the various quantities rather precisely. So in fact, the constants involved in our theorems are pretty close to what you observe in practice, basically a factor 10 off. And with that, I'm done.